Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Brian Kafferke, and I'm gonna have some fun with this particular video because there's always these lists, the 100 best songs of all time, the top best rock bands, etc. And of course, a list I always check out every year for fun is, what are the top programming languages or best languages to learn in year? Now, so I don't have to redo this video in a couple of months when the year changes, I'm doing it now. So let's jump in, and if you know me, I'm always drinking in different mugs. So today it is my Enterprise Federation mug. I visit there often, and I'm wearing a Microsoft shirt, but I don't work for Microsoft. I just don't happen to have a very wide wardrobe, so I wear the shirts I bought when I was at Microsoft. Cool. Let's jump in here and uh, get going. Before I do a little sales pitch, I actually did, uh, I left Microsoft uh, back in December, to spend the rest of my life until recently working full-time on a book called Master Azure Databricks. Now the interesting thing is I started working at Microsoft in 2017 in November and the first month I started Azure Databricks got announced and I got obsessed with it, got really excited about it and I just couldn't get enough of it. However, I did find it was really difficult to get good comprehensive documentation. It's always, it was always bits and pieces and I was trying to cobble together a, a picture of how this tool works. So just so you know, Databricks is a company founded by the creators of Apache Spark and it's essentially a user-friendly wrapper, a complete portal UI around it with a lot of extra services and goodies and development tools to help people jump started, you know, jump start and get into developing data engineering and data science pipelines and in a collaborative environment and Databricks. So most of what I write in Databricks in this book actually applies to Spark. It's a comprehensive resource, something I couldn't find when I was learning, and the goal is to take you from beginner to expert. So you don't really know anything, and it explains, well, what is Databricks relative to other Microsoft services in Azure? How do you start? What do you do? And it walks you through in a very, um, it's an expert resource, I'll say that in a minute, but it's a step-by-step -step process, so you learn with a use case. This company wants to create a data engineering, data science pipeline to solve this problem, and it walks you through step by step, which I think is the only way to learn Databricks because there's so many pieces. It's very deep, it's very wide, and Spark supports uh, Python, R, Scala, Java, and SQL, SQL uh, Structured Query Language. So it's a lot, a lot of stuff to learn, so I take you step by step. But I also wanted it to be an expert resource in the sense that it's well organized and it gets into some depth and some things that even people who have been using Databricks for a long time probably don't know. I learned some things about XML I didn't think I'd ever learned. <laughs> so I learned a lot of different twi tricks and especially, of course, the integration with Azure. And best of all, it's available on Amazon. So help me put my kids through college. Go out and buy it today. You'll be glad you did. So let's jump in. I'm going to do a spoiler alert. I'm going to save people who don't want to go through my riveting presentation a little time. If you're just starting out programming, you're a newbie and you kind of feel like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to learn, then I'm gonna save you some time because I'm gonna be doing more analysis. But if you're new to Python and you just wanna know what language should I start with, Python. That's it, Python. Just go learn Python, don't worry about anything else, and don't pay attention when anyone else says it's Python. I'll give you one other language though. If you wanna have a child, I had a neighbor that did this, they wanted their son to learn Python, you know, programming, and they said, what should I do? And he was under 10 years old, a little early maybe to start programming. I tried with my kids, it didn't work. But I would recommend probably this language called Scratch. I haven't used it personally. I did get them a book. It was his birthday. I bought him a book on Scratch programming. It looked pretty fun. It's kind of graphical and it kind of gets you used to doing programming kind of things, but it's not really, it didn't look like a real programming language, like all text-based, it's more graphical. But Maybe that'll be a good one if you're trying to teach a child. I wouldn't try to teach anyone under 10 years old Python, but who knows? So if you're still with me and you want to know more, what I really want to do here is break down, in a way, make fun of these lists of programming languages in general so you can laugh with me and understand why they don't really make a lot of sense and demystify it and then focus on what you really need to know and what you need to do. So I'm going to start out with programming and the best car to buy. Then I'll talk about programming uses and the winners are, and then I'll wrap things up. So let's jump in with this analogy, which is a neighbor of mine said, Brian, I'm looking to buy a car. What do you think is the car I should buy? 
And so I suggested this Hyundai, I think it's a Hyundai Accent. It's, it's a great car, fuel efficient. I mean, it runs well, it's got great reviews. That's the car. He's like, what are you kidding me? I got five kids, we've got hockey gear, we got all these things. I can't fit everybody in that. That's not gonna do it. Oh, okay, well, there you go. This'll do it, lots of space, it's a RAV4, it's a good car. You can fit all your stuff in it. Brian, I'm doing home projects. I need to lug lumber around and stuff from Home Depot and Lowe's and whatever. I'm like, oh, okay, how about this? You can still carry the kids around. It's got seating in the back for all the stuff you need in the trunk and or the back of the, the cab there or whatever, the truck park, and then uh, put your wood in there and you're good to go. And so he's like, that's what I'll do. That's great. And he went out and uh, he went out and bought this. <laughs> so just shows you, people don't listen to your advice anyway. But I think I think in his emotional side, he wanted to buy this in the first place. So it's kind of a waste of time really, but that's what people do. But you shouldn't. Listen to Brian's logic. What do you need is the question you need to ask yourself. So when you say, what language should I learn? In any programming concept, you need to ask these questions. But it's like, what do you need? By the way, that's the question you would ask in analysis. If you're asking somebody who wants you to write a program, you're going to say, what do you need? So let's talk about that. This is riveting, right? So the first place that languages focus on that I want to talk about is things like operating systems or really calculation intensive things things that have to do like memory graphics and move things around quickly and they have to compute rotating objects and things so you see CAD CAM things you see these fast video games or you think of operating systems like Windows and Linux and iOS these tools are typically written in a language like C C++ or assembler now these languages are not only a pain to write in, to be honest, they have complete control of the machine. They can write memory anywhere. They can crash the machine if they're not careful. I've done it with C back in the day. It's an interesting thing. And it takes a lot of code to pretty much do anything. Uh, I actually had a friend of mine, an assembler. He worked as an engineer. And he spent like days and days. And all he wrote was a program that if he hit a key, it would display it on the terminal because he was actually writing some sort of firmware. Um, okay, so when you think of that kind of thing, that is a valid use of programming languages, all right? But I don't think that's what most people want. And people watching my video to know what language to, to learn, they're, if they're doing this, they're probably not watching my video because they already know what they need to know. Next case, what's as you know me, uh, data and AI, artificial intelligence, are very near and dear to me. I've been working in data my whole life at least my program professional life so data analysis and data science what are the languages that really fit well there so we have languages like python and r scala sql and sas and of course there's matplotlib and mat matlab and a bunch of others these are languages that work in this space now we'll talk more about what are the best ones what ones to focus on here but these are areas you can look at sas is extremely expensive so this is where you get into you can throw that out. Even if SAS was the most popular statistical language out there, it's very expensive. Maybe your college or something got a good deal on it, but you're not going to be able to just go out and use SAS on your own unless they have a free version or something. And nowadays they may. But generally speaking, you have to think of that as well. It's not Everything's not free. What about systems administration? Most people probably don't even think much about this. Okay, Systems administration is something that database administrators do and systems administrators do to maintain the environment, right? New employees come in, they give them security, they may give them folders set up on shared drives, they may give them accounts to access different things, and the DBAs, the database administrators, they have to do backups, recoveries, they apply software patches, all these different things. And in the old days, this was pretty manual, but now they're using languages to automate these things. They're making it more scalable, right? Because you go to the cloud, and so you need to be able to do that. Well, in the Windows and the Azure world, PowerShell is pretty much the tool of choice. So knowing that's really important. Perl and Bash are very big on the uh, Linux world. And iOS probably, again, um, iOS is going to probably use something like Bash. Python, Ruby, etc. Those are also languages which are fairly popular that are you know, not really rooted in the operating system. And there are others, 
But these are your choices, again, for doing this. You generally speaking, you're not going to be using assembler. Some people may use C, but I think that's not as likely either. So these are the things you're going to look at. What about web and mobile apps? This is a very popular area, obviously, and most people probably are interested in writing these. Well, JavaScript, <coughs> excuse me, JavaScript is the king of this area. It's, still very, it's very popular. It's great because it can run in the browser. It's the only language really nowadays that is pretty much ubiquitously able to run in the browser and, and therefore can also run on mobile devices. So that's the one that's really got the line share. TypeScript is another language which is popular and also good for multi-platform. And then I put Python in here. It is not typically, if that's what your main focus is, a language you would do, but there is something called Kivi and it is doable. But Python will not run in your browser. Probably the more important area, which I say for last, is general usage, like kind of all things. I want to do some gaming, I want to do this, I want to write a lot of different types of programs. What are the languages which let me do that? So these are the languages which are pretty open. You can do anything you want, basically, with them. Python, Java. Now, Groovy and Ruby are really the sort of derivatives of Java. They use the Java virtual machine to run. But the idea with them is to make coding more simplified and allow you to do more with less lines of code. So Groovy and Ruby are trying to compete a little bit with Python. Uh, then you've got think languages like Haskell. And C Sharp is sort of Microsoft's answer to Java. It's, a, it's sort of the... Instead of just having Java, Microsoft came up with C Sharp to compete. So when you look at those, those are general purpose. A really good question though, and the one I started with at the very beginning of this video is, what about the beginning and learning language? And this is really important because none of these other things necessarily have to apply here. In the beginning learning languages, you want to learn how to program. You want to learn the programming concepts. And the most important thing is that you're learning a language which implements the most popular paradigms, the most popular uh, supports the most popular algorithms and things so that what you learn conceptually can be transferred to other languages, even if you don't end up working in that language specifically. You also want a language which is not going to be so complicated and so frustrating to use that you give up in frustrating, you know, frustration and run out the door screaming. So these are language which, languages which are pretty popular for that beginning learner. Python. JavaScript, I've seen quite a bit, and Scratch for Kids. Now, here's where I get to have some fun. I, I recently did my use of thing. I said, let me show you what they're saying now is the most popular languages to know. And it didn't really occur to me, and this is when I ended up writing the, this training video, it didn't occur to me how silly this really is. Let me just follow this link for a minute. And I want to show you like what you see when you look at this list. Now, I'm not going to get into all the verbies. Explain very vaguely why, how they got this number. But what I think is really interesting is the top language is C. Now I just told you C is like for writing operating systems and super fast algorithms. It's not very often anymore used as a beginning language. But there it is the most popular. So based on this list I should go out and learn C. Really strange. The next language is Java. I've heard Java called the new COBOL. I don't think Java people would like that. But I keep seeing more and more references and things like videos on YouTube and things that seem to be really indicating Java is slowing down and it's becoming less and less popular. It's mostly used as a back-end server type of language now and not as much in other places. The JVM is still, you know, like I mentioned, Ruby and Groovy, and it is used also in Apache Spark. But Java, eh, not sure about where that language is going. Not something that is typically considered an easy language to learn to start with. Uh, so then we have Python. Now what I really want to call attention to though is in the list where we have C of course and Python which are really different use cases in general. Uh, Visual Basic is I think not going anywhere. I think it's quickly going down because I don't see Microsoft even talking much about it anymore. But let's look at some of these other languages. Um, Mat MATLAB. MATLAB is a commercial software package. It's not cheap and Again, it's confusing because MATLAB is not something you can use to write a website. So whereas C can use write anything basically, and Java could and Python could, MATLAB is strictly for data science. So it really doesn't fit into these categories. The same is true of R. These are specialized languages. It is absurd to sort of put them in the same classification with C, you know, because they're very different. If you're doing data science, you're not going to be focused on the C language as the main language as a rule. And 
MATLAB maybe, but R, Python, yeah, those are languages you would use. And then you have all these these other things. So my point is that they're mixing apples and oranges when they show all these languages and tools. And I'm not really convinced that their algorithm even makes any sense. So yeah, not really buying this. Then they go into all these other languages. Logo is something that I saw, my, one of my first languages on my Atari 800XL. And I was like, wow, this was, there, it was one of these early languages. Surprised to still see it. And you know, all these other languages, PL SQL is the structured query language specific to Oracle. Transact SQL is the SQL language for SQL Server. SQL, I would argue, is not even really a full language. It's closer to what I would call an API, meaning it's something you feed to a service, ask for what you want in a specific way, and it gives it back to you, which I consider to be more of an API. And so again, you need it, but if you knew SQL, you're not gonna be able to do anything other than querying data. So what's my takeaway here is, this is all a mishmash and it doesn't mean much. And uh, I want this one. Yeah, go out and learn COBOL, awesome. All right, let's pop back here. I'm back to my riveting video. So here they talk about how they calculated. They go, the ratings are based on number of skilled engineers worldwide, courses and third-party vendors. What about them? Popular search engines such as Google, Bing, Yahoo, and blah, blah, blah. To calculate the ratings, I don't really see anything in here telling me how they did it. Maybe somewhere in the fine print it tells you that. Honestly, I think it's gibberish. I don't really know what to tell you as far as languages. I think you really have to just watch videos like mine. That'll tell you. I, I get it mostly from seeing what's going on in the industry, seeing products. The fact that Azure Machine Learning Service supports as a direct API with Toolkit, Python, that's the only language that it really supports to my knowledge out of the box with its SDK is a pretty good indication. Microsoft bet on Python. So I'll go with that. So let's get back to, and the winner is, you know, the runners up, this is like the Academy Awards. So for computer systems, super memory efficient and fast, the winner is C and C++, because I don't want to do assembler. What about data engineering, data science, and the winner is, you're gonna be surprised, you know, Python and SQL. Structured query language is absolutely needed across the board for anyone doing anything with data, period. Systems admin, and the winner is PowerShell for Windows at least, but PowerShell runs a Linux, so you can use it there, and then Bash. Those, and then these are like high-level winners. I'm gonna pick a few winners at the very end, though, though very few. Um, web and mobile apps, JavaScript. General use, and I'll be surprised, right? Python. And beginning and learning, Python and Scratch for kids. So these are the languages, and Python comes up a lot. Python is just, it just keeps getting extended and then ends up really good at anything. So it's, as I mentioned, you can do it in mobile apps using Kibi. It's got a Django to do web apps. It's actually really good at web apps. It's amazing in data science. So in addition to being an easier language than most to learn, a really nice to read and use language and multi-purpose, it's just kind of cr cuts across a lot of things. So the overall winner is Python. And I'm gonna throw SQL in there because if you're gonna do anything with data, you should learn SQL. Now let's wrap things up here. We talked about programming for what? I used the analogy of cars and what my neighbor wanted to buy because all the different cars support different types of benefits and trade-offs, right? And the same way, we talked about programming uses. What do you wanna do with this language? I, would, I wanna be careful there because I know a lot of people are you know, confused and they, they hear all this hype. People in the industry, you know, people who are DBAs or people who are already programming in Java, Where's my job going? What do I do? What languages should I learn? We're all in the same boat. We're all in this together. But you need to look behind the confusion. The media loves to just throw everything in your face and confuse you. But you can cut through the, the mystification. I think that's a word. And we talked about in the winners are. I just basically pulled out two that I really like. Python is the one. Take away Python. Not a surprise. I know. But I did want to slice to why Python makes sense. You can argue and you can go in your own way. That's fine. I also want to get away from something which is almost a religious attachment that people get to a certain service. Like I use SQL Server. I used it for decades now. But if SQL Server weren't there and wasn't popular, I have to be willing to let go of it and move on to what is. And the same way uh, I used to, I loved Visual Basic. I used it for years. I thought it was a great language. 
but I can see the writing on the wall. Visual Basic just isn't taking us into the future, and I don't see Microsoft really pushing it much anymore either. C Sharp, I don't know. We'll see. I think, I, so I'm kind of trying to be very neutral. I want to be like Spock on Star Trek, you know, because I have the Federation and everything. Be logical. Take your emotions out of it. Because if you don't, you might just be using the best language in the world, but you're the only one using it, and that's a danger. That's when you have, you're not employed. So we talked about that. We wrapped up, and I want to thank you. Please subscribe, share, and like, and click on the notifications. I'm going to have all these links here. You can do the subscribe on my face. There should be a red arrow here somewhere. You can also click on. Let people know about this. Let me know what you think of this. I look at the comments and really excited about all these things. So take care, and as they say in the Klingon world, kapla.